Well, here we are at the workshop. And this is the workshop of John Rennick, the national speed record holder for Ultometheus, the streamliner. And we're in his workshop, and you can see down through there. And here, indeed, we have Master John himself. Hello, John. Hello, Harvey. Nice and what have, you, what have you got here? Oh, this is uh, the covered-up Epimetheus. Uh, it's naked under here, so I have to be a bit uh, <laughs> careful about his sensitivity. There she is. There's sprinting uh, Vincent, uh, without its tank cover and tail and cover for all electronics, because it's brought back from the Brighton Speed Trials, having just run, and uh, uh, we've just been having a look-see to see... Uh, why it didn't perform basically. Uh, we had electronic problems, but there we are. It's another story. So, here in the ante room, we've got the fuel tank cover for Epimetheus, but there's a little Comet engine, another Vincent engine, nice set of tools. But if we pan around into the workshop itself, you can see another Vincent in there, a Series A twin. Now here we have all the storage, John calls it his old junk, and you can see there, coming around we have the Series A Twin Vincent, restored by Brian Verrill but fettled by John Rennick and just been on the dyno and ready for the road. So hello John, how long uh, have you been here? Uh, well I've lived on this site for 40 years. In, that, in the workshop? The workshop I built in 1979, so this workshop I've been filling up with junk for the last 30 years, <laughs> 33 years. Can we come and have a look at your junk? Indeed, by all means, yes. So how many files have you got, John? Oh, I don't know. Uh, plenty, but mostly worn out. <laughs> well, like them. you? Yeah, exactly. Everything, everything here is getting a bit too old, like me. So how many lathes have you got here? We've got two lathes. The first lathe I bought was this Colchester student. I bought that in 1972 and it's been in use ever since. That's uh, the most used lathe and a vital tool. Uh, the second lathe, the, the uh, Chipmaster, is a tool, tool room lathe and uh, also nice and accurate but getting a bit worn out. Uh, it's a variable speed gearbox is on its way. So what, that like one might last as long as me or it may not. We'll see. <laughs> And on the bench here, what have you got on under the, the cover? Bench, uh, this is a. Whoa! Hey, there we are. That's a standard Vincent Rapide engine. Uh, it's one I'm building up from bits I've had lying around for years. Well, just... And I've just about got enough bits to build a whole bike. Right. Uh, it won't be a matching numbers thing, but it's all original Vincent stuff, and the engine's now done. Right. So, in due course, that will be a complete bike. So, what have you got there then, John? Well, this is my precious Beaver milling machine. Uh, Beaver's an old British make, it's, uh, I don't know what vintage, it's probably 50 years old. Uh, but its great uh, advantage is the spacer section here, which gives me the height which allows me to line bore a Vincent crankcase. Uh, very useful, it's highly adjustable, quite accurate, very rigid. So it's a, it's a vital tool. How anyone can live without a milling machine, I just don't know. <laughs> this is my polishing machine. This is a uh, five horsepower motor, so it's a mighty polisher. Uh, that does good service. I, you know, make things uh, look a bit bright and shiny with that. So it works better than a three-quarter horse washing machine engine? Rather more than that, yes. It's a <laughs> mighty three. I, I'm very fortunate that I have three-phase uh, electricity here, so I can, I've got plenty of horsepower available. This dividing head I found outside a welding shop one day. The welder was using it to, to rotate bits of metal that he could weld on. And I managed to stop him from destroying it and dragged it out and I've been using it ever since. And does it work? Oh, it's fine, yeah. Good as gold. Yeah. Here are all the little holes for dividing. Indeed, yes, that's right. Uh, but, but nowadays they do it on digital. Yes, but uh, I'm old and crusty and... I haven't learned how to do that, and in any case, I've got no such equipment, but I get all the answers with this dividing head. I was taught differential indexing and everything else with these things as a lad, so I can do all sorts of tricks with this. Right, what have you got under there, John? Oh, well, this is my uh, cam grinding device. It's basically a jig and tool grinder for sharpening uh, milling cutters and 
and so on. But I've made a little fixture here that allows me to make my own cams, uh, basically for racing purposes. And I have here, I have here the master cam that I've evolved over a period of time. And uh, then the cam to be ground goes on the shaft and lines up with the key that holds it in line with this one. It goes in place here and then the spring-loaded sliding bed which is operated by hand. It's very primitive but I'm able to grind and follow the cam. The new cam being ground off this wheel it needs to go that way. Thus, there we are. The new cam is in that place and there's a grinding wheel. The, the follower that follows this cam is the exact radius of the, of the grinding wheel so that it uh, produces the same profile. And uh, this uh, shape I've evolved over a period of time to produce a decent diagram, basically. There are well-established diagrams for this type of cam. The only Vincents that are going well have got these cams in it. Uh, Roy Robertson, my own stuff, Carlton Palmer, Dunphy, all of the guys that are any good, any good, that have got decent engines that run well, have got my cams. Now in the corner here, we have the old engine testing kit and in this little room is where John used to mount the engines. Here he is hidden away. Hello John. Yeah, hello. Here we are again. The engine was uh, mounted here, uh, engine and gearbox unit, and then the gearbox output drove that sprocket, which is connected to a bearing housing and a flexible coupling, driving the dynamometer that's outside. The shaft uh, is coming through to one end of the dynamometer here. The dynamometer shaft is rotating in this casing, which is full of water, pressurised with a pump from outside and water tank. Uh, the casing is on trunnions, uh, which allows it to move. The impeller tends to uh, force the casing to rotate, which is resisted by a spring balance and a, and a strain gauge here. The strain gauge sends that load, which times a distance gives a torque to the computer. And uh, RPM is also measured, and of course the computer does the sums, and producing a horsepower figure. <laughs> nice and simple, really. Okay, I actually can operate this thing completely alone. I'm able to start the engines in there, but uh, the starter system is on the dynamometer here. Uh, conventional motor car starting system. Uh, I have a clutch here and throttle and so I'm able to to uh, uh, drive the machine and here is the means of varying the load on the dynamometer so whilst holding the throttle open I can increase the load watching RPM and watching various readouts from the computer and uh, so I could actually handle the whole thing single-handed, which was done many times. And you never fell off that bike then, never did you? Never fell off it once, that's <laughs> right. I'm un unscarred by this machine, <laughs> which is not true of all of them. <laughs> this is my homemade rolling road dynamometer. Basically, the, the rear wheel drives a drum. The drum drives a newly acquired torque measuring system. That drives uh, a sprocket on a bearing assembly. That chain drives uh, another drum which is a heavy piece of inertia. Uh, it's, it's the same diameter there, it's about 10 inch diameter and 4 foot long, full of concrete. And that drives what's under here. There's the end of the drum. On the end of that drum is a uh, Jaguar disc brake which gives me a hydraulic uh, variable Hang function. on a minute, I've got to come and have a look at that, John. <laughs> uh, hydraulic variable function that I can yeah. tr control whilst driving the bike. Uh, but then another sprocket drives this piece of wind resistance. This is calibrated wind resistance, rotating flat plates, which absorb power in the same way as driving a bike down the road. Uh, and the little so, wheel there? Sorry? And the little wheel? Oh, the little wheel is just the starter system. In here is a 10 horsepower electric motor, and uh, the, <coughs> the lever pulls the, the, the uh, this is a go-kart wheel, uh, down onto the a drum on the starter motor, on the 10 horsepower motor, brings it in contact with this drum, spins it round, sends the horsepower down the line, back to the rear wheel, spins the rear wheel of the bike, 
and starts, starts the up. engine. Starts so you've got you've got the, you've got a dynamometer and an engine starter. Well, yes, you you've got to have a means of starting it because mostly I play with racing bikes here that have no other means of starting them. You, they normally race bikes, of course, bump started. And you or, don't bump start anymore, John? Uh, well, I don't, you can't do it here. We can't run down the road here. <laughs> Not enough room. So that's the run down the road function. <laughs> well, I have all forms of welding. This is a, a, a MIG set. And then I a TIG, sorry, tungsten in our gas set. Uh, I have a MIG set here. I have a, an electric arc welding set over here. Oxyacetylene welding. So all the forms of welding, really. So I can stick bits of metal together fairly successfully one way or another. <laughs> and... Uh, then the other way of put sticking bits of metal together is with the mighty press. This is a 50 ton press. How um, many? 50 tons. 50 tons? 50 ton it will push, yes. And uh, with that I push together my uh, all pressed up Vincent crankshafts uh, that are hard on the ground. There are no nuts and screws on these things at all. It's a modern way of doing the, the old fashioned flywheels. And all that is so that we can put together things like Epi. Epi has the pressed up flywheels and, and those flywheels have been in there since the turn of the century. So are you, are you having fun John? I always have fun. Never, never ending. Well here's Alto Metheus, one of John Rennick's creations. Here's one of his records and here are some of the things. These are going back to 2008. Yeah. And right. here's John. What did you do in 2012 then, John? 2012, uh, the final run uh, uh, reached a speed of 205 miles an hour. Um, and this shows, in fact, the engine RPM uh, through the range, through the gears, and then into fifth gear and accelerating to 205. Uh, the measured average speed uh, was uh, 191. The, the exit speed, uh, 196. But this is... Uh, a speed indicated from the engine RPM, which is absolutely accurate. Uh, and it was hot over there. It was very warm, yes, it's always very warm, but in September, uh, when we're there, in end of August, it's acceptable. The temperature's only sort of 85, 90 degrees. In August, uh, when the cars are there, speed week, it's most of the time over 100, which uh, in the blazing salt light is quite painful. So can you show me your other shed then, John? All right, of course, yes, we'll go to the other playroom.